Hello! So we're back from lunch break. <laughs> that was, was yummy, right? So, um, as most of you might know, um, it's the very first time we are putting this up. And we would love to get any kind of feedback you got. And of course, we would prefer if you come, just speak to us. But if you won't speak to us because you hate all the stuff we're doing over there, um, we put up the wall just right from Lightning Talks. Um, there is a pencil, and just write down whatever you have in mind. We really appreciate any kind of feedback. So, up next, um, we got a topic about copy and pasting code. So, please give a warm welcome to Professor Dr. Mike Gottfried. Mm. Can you hear me? Ooh, I can hear me. I bet, I bet you can hear me. Um, all right, as he said, opening the bottle of water next to the laptop. Um, first of all, I want to say something. I'm sorry. I'm really, really sorry because you guys thought you were through listening to boring professors, those of you who went to university, and here I am inflicting myself upon you now. So the other thing is that Canadians, at least among Americans, have a reputation for always apologizing, even when it's not their fault. So you can actually try this. If you step on a Canadian's foot, he'll say, oops, sorry. It, it, it works. You can try this. Not on me, because I'm wise to you. Um, so I wanted to tell you a little bit about myself and a little bit about what I'm going to talk about, and then I'll tell you what I was going to tell you. Um, so yeah, I'm Mike Godfrey. Please call me Mike. Uh, um, so my Twitter handle is, is my God. Uh, <laughs> That, they let me have that. That was no trouble. It was the university I had troubles with because they wanted to call me M.W. Godfrey 37 or something. And I, I said, I will change my name to Michael Iolanthi God, and then you'll be forced to do M-I-G-O-D. Um, I'm at the University of Waterloo, which is near Toronto in Canada. Uh, we're part of, uh, a few of us are part of the Software Architecture Group, or as we call ourselves, SWAG. That's our little <laughs> acronym down there. And... Uh, I had to fight for that one, too. Um, a place, things you might have heard of Waterloo. Anybody follow ice hockey? Might have heard of Bauer Hockey Equipment. They're from Waterloo. Seagram's, the distillery. They're from Waterloo. Uh, Maple, the algebraic software package. Some of you might have used that, especially for your engineers. That's uh, from Waterloo. And uh, the big thing in town that's technical, apart from the university, is the BlackBerry. The BlackBerry World Headquarters is across the parking lot from where I am. And I wanted to talk to you today about um, copy-paste, which we call code cloning. And uh, yeah, so the sheep is, is the mascot of, uh, as, as you can imagine, you know what sheep that is, right? It's Dolly the sheep. This, I'm not shamelessly pandering to Australians in the crowd. That's, uh, that's actually a British sheep. Uh, and yeah, that is Dolly the sheep. And uh, that's a quote from Handel's Messiah, all we like sheep. Um, we, we, we all do this, and, uh, and I'd like to talk to you about why it's sometimes a good idea. So you've heard the DRY principle, don't repeat yourself. Um, I'm going to say it's okay. You know, sometimes it's the reasonable thing to do. It's okay to repeat yourself. You should feel, you know, not feel ashamed of it. Feel like it's something you need to do in a judicious way as an expression of, of uh, what it is that you're trying to do. And sometimes it makes perfectly good sense to do that. Okay, so onward and upward. What I'm going to do now is, this is audience participation. I'm going to show you two slides that are almost the same. The code's a little bit different. And what I'd like you to do is to look and see if you can spot the differences, all right? This isn't hard. All right, one, this is from Apache, by the way. Real source code. Two, one, two, one, two, one, two. Any ideas? Threads, all right. So there's uh, one difference here. If you notice the string, the output string is a little bit different. Anybody else notice anything else? The indentation. The indentation. Okay, so the indentation probably, well, I mean, it's not going to matter, right? Because you're going to throw out the white space when you, when you compile it. 
But the, the string could be a problem because there could be a regression test somewhere. It's expecting one message. And if you run the different version of it, why do you have two versions of the startup routine? I don't know. Maybe it runs in a different operating system or something. So that's a really good question. You scratch your head and you wonder, well, why is this similar but different stuff here, especially when you're almost certainly only going to be running one of these? Well, it's a good question. So we'll go on. Here's another one. This is from GNUmeric, which is a, a GNU spreadsheet like Excel. And in this case, this is code one, and this is code two. So can you see how they're similar but different? Well, I'll just give you a... So you'll see this. Some of the magic numbers are different. And I think that's basically it. So what these are, and this is something you see in C code all the time. You see a conversion routine because C doesn't support generics and object orientation and all that. You have this really crufty stuff where if you want to convert from one kind of thing to another kind of thing, you have this real boilerplated stuff. And you think, OK, could we have done it differently? Well, we could have done it in a different language. But if we're committed to C, then probably not. So the good news is this is probably going to all of these routines, and there's a whole bunch of them, are probably going to be in the same file. And they're probably going to be indented in exactly the same way. And if you need to make a change to one of them, you're probably going to remember to make a change to all the others. Uh, in fact, this might even be automatically generated. I don't know for, for sure. Uh, but it is, a, uh, it is one of the practices that if you have something that needs to be uniformly almost the same but a little bit different, that you can manage this successfully. Now, here's something which is also from GNUmeric. And we're going to do the back and forth thing again. And this is the last one. And uh, this is a little more problematic. Now, see if you can spot the difference. Differences. Anybody? OK, so it's been system, the ver various uh, bits and pieces have been systematically renamed from range to range ref, or maybe it was the other way around. There's one other way, one other thing that's different. And it's subtle. Right. So in one case, the parameter is a pointer to a const. In the other case, it's a const pointer. Now, probably it's not going to be an issue because nobody's fiddling around with the internal state anyway. But what's happened here is that somebody wrote the original code. Somebody, maybe the same person, copied it somewhere else. And then somebody said, oh, look, there's a bug. I'll just fix it there. But they didn't fix the other one because they didn't know about it. So this inconsistent maintenance problem is, again, one of the issues that we worry about when we're talking about uh, uh, code duplication or code cloning. This is one of the things we're, we're a little bit scared of. OK. So you might ask, what is a clone to begin with? Do we have a formal definition of it? And we do have a great definition given by Ira Baxter, who's a, a researcher in the area. He's actually a practitioner. He runs a small company out of Austin, Texas. And his definition is, a software clone, well, those are segments of clone that are similar, uh, according to some definition of similarity. We don't really know which one. And this is one of the problems when we talk about it as a research area. There are many ways of comparing pieces of code to each other, which make total sense, but they're typically incompatible with each other. So we can't compare results from the tools very easily. We know the duplication is there. If you do a little bit of looking, you, you're sure, pretty sure that, yeah, that was definitely copied from that. But it's very hard to be systematic in how we talk about uh, anything to do with numbers. So that's, that's a bit of a problem, too. Well, how do we actually uh, do any work at all? Well, Stefan Bellon and Reiner Koschka, who are from uh, University of Bremen, just down the road a bit, uh, came up with a taxonomy where they came up with uh, three and, and then eventually a fourth a category. Uh, and we affectionately call them type one, two, and three, and four clones. So two pieces of code are type one clones if they're token for token identical. If, as we saw in the numeric little example, if you ignore variable names and ignore magic numbers, uh, so you map all identifiers to id and all numbers to num or something like that. Those are type 2 clones, but they're still token for token identical apart from that. And then we get to type 3, where basically say, and they can be a little different too. They can have extra stuff. And of course, if your tolerances are big enough, any two pieces of code uh, are clones if you consider that they agree on zero tokens and then they have this large gap. So the question is, how do we design these tools, and, and how big the should the gaps be? And, and, and those are good questions. We don't really have an answer for it. And for completeness, we have the idea that uh, because this does happen, that sometimes people have two implementations of the same idea uh, elsewhere in the code. This is very hard to detect unless they happen to have the same API, and you can run tests over them. Uh, it's an undecidable p problem in general if you look at two pieces of code and ask, do they have the same output? So that's a problem as well. 
There we go. So how do we actually do this in practice? Well, again, as I said, a number of ways of doing it. Generally, it involves processing the source code so that we have some intermediate representation. Now, this might be just a token stream or even a stream of strings, or it might be something more complicated like a parse tree or even a program dependence graph, which is a fancier version of, uh, well, it, it's a little bit different. Um, but the problem is, as you start up there, um, it's very easy to do the comparisons, but you also get, it's, it's also um, less accurate, and as you get into the, the graph transformations and you're comparing graphs to each other, it gets to be very, very complex. So what most people typically do is they will take a token stream and decide what their tolerance is for matching tokens, and maybe they'll add markup at the beginning and ends of, of uh, functions, because what you're doing is you're comparing every code to every other piece of code, and uh, the more pre-processing you can do to get it to two things you can compare easily, the easier it's going to be when you do the comparison. Uh, the first pass is basically compile time, so that's going to be order n and the size of number of tokens. But then if you're doing the comparison, you're, you're uh, looking at a, a chunk of size k, and you're comparing you know, a gazillion of them, then you're doing a gazillion of these matches, and that can be very expensive. So there's also other ways. For example, we used a lightweight semantic model in one of the approaches that we took. And what we did there was we computed the call flow graph. We did this at the granularity of methods. And we said, well, who calls whom? And we'll ignore everything else apart from the methods and who calls whom and who does that guy call. And we compared the call sets. And we found out that that was actually highly, uh, I mean, it didn't catch all of them. But uh, if you were willing to grade through the results, it was actually a really good way of doing it. And it was very, very fast as well. Okay, so now what I want to do is to phrase it as, as an engineering problem. I was originally giving this talk uh, a couple of versions ago at a conference, and they had a session on what they called software engineering myth busting. And so my myth that I wanted to bust was that cloning was always a problem because most of the early work on cloning would start with the assumption, you know, if you clone, you're basically evil and stupid and you shouldn't do it. And my God, look at the mess we're going to have to clean up, you idiot. So I wanted to say, well, you know, um, I think I've seen code where it might have been a good idea, and so maybe we should consider it. So what I did was I went looking for quotes that I could attack. It's like kind of a straw man. So here's a good one from an excellent book. Uh, this is from the Bad Smells uh, chapter in Refactoring. Number one in the Sting Parade is duplicated code. If you can see the same code structure in more than one place, you can be sure, there we go, it's authoritative, that your program would be better if you found a way to unify them. And another one, just for good measure, we, we took a quote from Ralph Johnson's blog, one of the Gang of Four from the Design Patterns. So copy-paste is not necessarily bad in the short run, especially if you're using good code, but it's always bad in the long run. So there we go. Here's our myth that I want to bust. Code cloning is always bad in the long run. Now, why is it supposed to be bad? There are two basic reasons. Number one, as you duplicate more and more, the design becomes craftier, it becomes harder to deal with. The decisions that you make, you have to start working around, and it becomes part of the de facto design, even if it wasn't the best idea in the first place. So you have a, a, a less essential design of the thing that you're trying to do. And the other problem, as we talked about, was the inconsistent maintenance problem, that as you change something in one place, you're not always aware that you're changing in all the right places. So those are the two big problems. And what are you supposed to do? Well, refactor, refactor, refactor. If you're using OO programming, you're creating these intermediate abstractions, these parent classes, you're moving the commonalities up there, you're using generics appropriately, you're using parameters appropriately, et cetera. So how many people here, when you write code, how many people write code regularly? Okay, most people. How many of you do copy-paste? All right, the rest of you are liars. <laughs> I don't think you're stupid. I think you know what you're doing, right? So cloning is bad, whoops, you know, how did that happen? Have we been led, led astray in, in, in how we do development? Well, I want to now turn to the arts. The last talk I, I, I really enjoyed, uh, talking about the idea of, of narrative and storytelling. And uh, let's just have a little musical interlude, but I won't sing. And uh, I'll give you the words in one place from Handel's Messiah, and you'll recognize this from the beginning. It goes, all we like sheep, all we like sheep, all we like sheep, all we like sheep, I think they like sheep, all we like sheep have gone astray. So 
the, Handel didn't write the libretto, some other fellow did, adapted from a biblical uh, reference. So is this terrible art? I mean, look, it's got all that duplication. It's awful, right? Well, no, of course not. The answer is that when we have art, we rely on these forms and repetition and familiarity and choruses and structures and narrative themes are all part of it. So you say, okay, okay, well, that's the arts. We're doing engineering, right? We don't do duplication in engineering. But in fact, we do it all the time. We don't have, uh, we don't have need of, of ritual and, and making people feel better, but in traditional engineering, Repeating design elements that we trust is a traditional way of scaling up. You want to build something bigger, put three of them together. It works. And you say, okay, okay, well, that's, that's you know, building a bridge or something. But this is software engineering. We don't need to replicate stuff, right? I mean, that's really dumb. And the answer, well, you know, there are these other things that we do all the time. Virtual machines. I don't think I've seen a technical talk here that hasn't involved virtual machines. So you folks already believe in that. Well, that's good. So you say, well, okay. Fine, that's like a deployment thing, that's not a design thing. So what if I'm working within a single system? And again, we have a whole bunch of uh, uh, examples of things that are held to be good ideas that do involve duplication. So my favorite one is the rule of three from extreme programming that says, um, basically, the first time you do something, you do it. The second time you do the same thing, just do it again. And the third time, that's when you know you got a common abstraction. And that's when you know it's time to sit down and redesign. And, and the thing to watch out for, and this is something I used to do when I was a young programmer, was premature abstraction. And that is try to write the most general kind of code you could possibly. And so that's generally held to be a bad thing. And you need to think about the cost of abstraction as well. Um, my colleague, Jim Cordy, who's a professor at Queen's University in uh, Canada, not Queen's Belfast, uh, made an awful lot of money from the banks and insurance companies uh, in the lead up to the Y2K meltdown that didn't really occur, but he made a lot of money at it. And he went to banks and insurance companies, or actually they came to him, and they had these crufty old COBOL and sometimes Fortran systems. And they said, you know, we need you to fix, spot the places where this Y2K stuff might be a problem for us. And they initially said, okay, we'll just go down and we'll, traditional, we'll go through and rewrite all your things, clean up the structure. And they went, oh, no, you're not. Holy cow, you are so not going to do that. You're just going to go in there and selectively change the little bits and pieces. Because COBOL is such an awful language, it's very hard to get it to do the things that you want to do. When you get a design that works, you stick to it. It's a, it's a golden thing. And you share it with your friends and you have them make changes. So you try not to get a, around it if you have uh, an abstraction that it, or an, a mechanism that doesn't support the abstractions that you want. So, again, this idea of cloning being a bad thing was something that my PhD student Corey and I and my colleague Jim Cordy and others thought probably was not true, that sometimes you could do it in a principled way. So what we said, what we sat down to do was to figure out an argument as to why that might be the case. Why might it be the case that uh, in a systematic way it was a reasonable decision? And we wanted to do some measuring. So the first thing to do was to kind of set a, a plan, a template for why people might do this. And uh, we're going to play a different game now. And uh, this game is called Sex the Fish. There are three fish. Some of them are male, some of them are female. This is the bluegill sunfish, which is actually native to southern Ontario, but it's famous in evolutionary uh, biology for a certain reason. Anybody want to take a guess? There's at least one male and at least one female. Anybody want to guess? Take a fish, any fish. The one, the, is male. Male. the one in the middle is male. Why do you say that? Because I don't know, it's one of the three. Okay. Se uh, fish are sexually dimorphic usually, which means that the males and females often have different sizes. And um, in fact, there is one male there, and there's one female and one male, and I don't know which one it is here. Thing is, he doesn't know either. The bluegill sunfish have this really strange uh, growth pattern whereby when a, a male fish reaches a certain size, it has to make a life decision. Do I go big or do I go small? And so it's got the female, it's got the paternal male, which is territorial and defends its turf. And then it's got what's called the cuckolder male, which has two phases in life. It has what's called a sneaker, where basically it's on the outskirts and if it sees a female in the male's territory, it sneaks in, mates, and goes back out, and eventually it grows into something that pretty much looks like a female. And then it can basically cavort 
in the, the, the t territorial male's territory, and the, this guy just thinks he's at a great party, and, uh, and goes on from there. And it's a fascinating thing, but it's not in the DNA. These fish, the two different males, are not genetically different as far as anybody can tell. It's somehow they make a decision to go big or go small. So if you want to understand, and this is really belaboring a point, but I enjoy this example so much I have to give it. Um, you have to understand the environment, the deployment environment. You have to understand how things actually work. It isn't enough just to know the coding. It's not enough just to know the DNA to understand what's going on here. So yeah, that was what that was about. All right. um, so what I did here with my uh, student, Corey, is we worked out sort of three main categories with about 10 altogether subcategories. And we sat down and we, we poured through a lot of qualitative data and we tried to group all of the stuff into why would people actually do this and what does it mean? So we came up with three basic categories. We came up with what we called forking, where it was a, a design decision mostly. A, 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 this is strategic, we want to do something a little bit different, but it's also at the same time we want to maintain the other one. Uh, we did this thing called templating, which is mostly about having uh, a language or a set of abstractions or stuff that you want to do that's very similar to some other stuff that you want to do, but you can't really combine them into one. If you've ever written GUI code, you'll often know that you've written this code for a menu, and oh my god, it's really, really similar to this other code, but it's not similar enough that you can actually combine them into one. So that, that we would call a, an API or a, a library protocol, or anybody who's using a certain uh, uh, API will know that if you need to use something in a certain way, well, you always have to first create it, then you open it, then you use it, then you close it, and you unlink it, or something like that. And then finally, we have these uh, post hoc customizing, which is basically a, a, a way of saying this is the stuff that didn't fit into the other ones. And we wrote this up, and we did an experiment, and uh, we ran um, uh, both Gnumeric and Apache through uh, somebody else's clone detection tool, and we did a categorization of it. And we wrote it up in a paper called Cloning Considered Harmful, Considered Harmful. And of course, <laughs> Now, the, the, the straightforward way of saying that is that cloning isn't always a bad idea. But then you lose the meme, right? Dijkstra's meme about, in his case, go to is considered harmful. So if I rewrote that, it wouldn't have the same meaning. In other words, cloning is good, at least as far as the title goes, because it conveys a joke. And uh, that was presented at the, the 2006 working conference on reverse engineering. And it was also the core of Corey's uh, PhD thesis. Anyway, so um, what forking is, just to give you an example of one of them, uh, is often you'll have uh, an idea and you want to do it somewhere else a little bit differently. So it's often used to springboard new or experimental ideas. Um, two examples, and I'll go into platform variation as a sub-example of it, where you've got, uh, with the Apache portable runtime, there's basically a virtualization layer if you want to deal with the operating system. So instead of having to embed in the code, if I'm doing uh, BSD Unix, then do this. If I'm doing Linux, then do that. If I'm doing Win32, then do this other thing. They basically call a virtualization layer, which is then implemented in a directory which is named for the operating system that it implements. And there's a lot of duplication among the, the various implementations of basically doing the same thing. How do you open a file, et cetera. And the designers of Apache decided that that was preferable to inlining everything with if defs in, in, in the main code. And so it's documented, it's well understood, it's carefully engineered. This is a primo example of how people will use cloning in a principled way to achieve a design goal. And uh, so we talked about other things such as for each of the uh, uh, examples that we came up with, we had a little template and we talked about the motivation, some examples, the advantages and disadvantages, the management and long-term issues, what you need to worry about and how you would spot it in code. And then we did this little study and this is just a random sampling of all the cloning we found. Um, the actual numbers, if I said there were 3,000 clones in Apache, you shouldn't pay much attention to the number because it's very dependent on, as I said, the tool and the thresholds that you use. But if you believe that most of the things that we saw in there were clones, and we did um, hand validate about 100 from each of them, and we threw out the ones we felt were, weren't real clones, and then we categorized them and tried to decide whether or not it was a reasonable design decision, whether it was laziness or something that was 
I guess, cleverness. And so if you look here, and so this is Apache, and this is GNUmeric, and it, again, the numbers aren't the point. I mean, you could sort of say, oh, look, the GNUmeric guys are much worse at programming than the Apache guys, but that, that, that's a terrible use of metrics. The interesting way to do it is you look and you get, okay, there were originally 100, uh, some of them got thrown out because they weren't worthy, but look, there's a significant amount of reasonable use of cloning. And here too, even if it's one, one to two against, there's still a fair number of examples of where this was a reasonable use of cloning. And there's another example too, you notice in the forking, there's an awful lot in Apache and there's zero in GNUmeric. That's because GNUmeric is written on top of GTK and that does all of the platform stuff for you. So there's no platform stuff in there. Whereas the whole point of part of Apache is that it's a you know, back-endian thing that runs on a bunch of servers, so you can, a bunch, runs on a bunch of platforms, so you're gonna see that there. On the other hand, GNUmeric is heavily UI oriented and I wouldn't say there's a whole lot of UI in. Uh, in Apache, so you do see of the so many that you're going to see, you're going to see most of them in the in the gee, I wish I had an OO language, or gee, I wish there was a simpler way of doing this, in uh, uh, with the user interface. So that's that. So in the long run, um, maybe I've convinced you that uh, cloning is not such a bad idea. So I'd like to call this busted, and I'd like to suggest a different motto, that it's often useful in the long run if you do it with design principles in mind, if you maintain it, if you communicate it, if you make sure that uh, everybody knows what you're doing. All right, so in summary, um, it's pretty obvious that cloning is, is a commonly done thing in a lot of industrial software. Don't repeat yourself isn't always the right thing to do if you've got good engineering principles for, for not doing it. And there have been a bunch of studies by other people that I haven't quoted here that look at things like bugs in code involved in cloning versus code not involved in cloning and show that it's really no buggier than uh, the stuff that isn't, so it really doesn't seem to be a problem. And finally, there is the paper that I alluded to that if you're interested in, you can look up. If you'd like to read a, a more folksy presentation of it, this book from O'Reilly um, has an awesome chapter in it, 28, and uh, I wrote it. And, <laughs> and it, uh, this is a book on empirical software engineering and it's written for the practitioner. It's not written as an academic thing. It's written by academics to sort of say, hey, look, I've got this really interesting result you should hear about. And, uh, yeah, all proceeds go to Amnesty International, so I, unfortunately I'm not getting uh, rich off of it. And that's all I gotta say. <laughs>